As, as Tom said, I'm the uh, editor and publisher of the World Affairs Brief. It's a weekly news analysis service that concentrates on helping you understand what the globalist agenda is in domestic and foreign policy in the United States. The government will, of course, claim that they're <clears throat> doing everything in the interest of the nation, in the interest of the taxpayer, but they're not. Ever since, I think, Ronald Reagan was the last president we had that was not a controlled uh, puppet. Eisenhower was, Kennedy was, uh, Nixon was, Ford was, um, and of course George W. Bush was, and, and uh, Barack Obama. A lot of you who have been exposed to the conservative, the quote, mainstream conservative network like Fox News, We'll get a lot of information about Barack Obama, negative information. One of the most prominent concepts is that he's a Marxist and he's a Muslim. It's not true. He used to be a Marxist. He never was a Muslim and never was a Christian. He's simply gone to those various religions and uh, when it suits political purposes. But he's an a religious person, has no religious beliefs whatsoever. Uh, and he sold out long ago to the globalists. And that's why Barack Obama is a puppet to them. He's got more skeletons in his closet than, um, I don't know what to compare it with, but he's got a lot. Uh, Barack Obama's a homosexual. It's a sham marriage he has. Uh, Barack Obama has, uh, is an illegal alien. In fact, uh, his father, uh, Obama, probably wasn't his father. It was probably a sham marriage as well to cover up for his real father, Mr. Marshall, a Marxist activist. And his mother was having a pornographic relationship with Marshall in his home in Hawaii. And uh, yeah, they got together, uh, <clears throat> Hussein Obama, to marry her to cover up for the pregnancy that was. Um, and if you look at the pictures between of. Uh, of Mr. Marshall and Obama, you see a very distinct relationship <clears throat> that you don't see it with his father from Kenya. Um, but nevertheless, he holds a, he has an illegal alien status. He holds a false social security card, which was provided to him by the government. And so they got a lot to twist his arm with. He worked for the CIA while he was at Occidental University, and that's why no one knew him there. He did have a roommate who occasionally saw him when he wasn't uh, out of the country doing special assignments for the CIA. So once you go down that road, you know, like Hillary Clinton, they make you wealthy. How is it that a person like Barack Obama, who has never earned more than $60,000 a year as a community organizer, is worth over $20 million today? You know, it's the $100,000 stock deals that Hillary Clinton got when she was part of the Rose Law Firm. This is the way that they handle insiders, not Marxists. They handle people who convert and come over to globalism and do their bidding. So America will not be solved by getting rid of Barack Obama. I'm here to tell you that the establishment has been trying to give you a controlled Republican as the next president to undo the fervor that you have against Obama and against the Democratic administration. They know that you'll go down and go to sleep if they give you a Republican like George W. Bush. But unfortunately, and this is one of the four or five areas in which the globalists have, are meeting tremendous resistance today. They've had a free ride all the way up through George W. Bush. But the globalists have met severe resistance in five major areas. Politics, which I'll talk about first. Uh, the EU and uh, globalist uh, uh, free trade agreements, tremendous amount of resistance. Immigration, tremendous amount of resistance. Gun control, tremendous amount of resistance. Despite all of their efforts to manipulate things like what just happened in California. And I'll cover the manipulative evidence that will show you that this was a government operation as, were, as have been almost all of the mass shootings that we have to deal with today. But let's first talk, talk about politics. I predicted in the World Affairs Brief long ago that they would not really want Hillary Clinton to be president. I mean, she looks like a slam dunk, but she's not. Hillary Clinton has a very difficult time being popular even with the Democrats. And that's why Bernie Sanders is so 
you know, the hardcore Democrats really want a hardcore socialist. Hillary Clinton is, uh, you know, a globalist puppet. And so she'll bend with the waves, and so she doesn't really have a good, strong reputation even with the hardcore Democrats. But the powers that be know that Hillary Clinton will actually try to run the White House if she gets in. She is a real dominant woman. And she's got a lot of skeletons in her closets as well. But they really want a compliant puppet. They'd just as soon have Barack Obama watching his sports shows on television until they call him to read his script, and that's why he needs a teleprompter so often. But they're planning in the political realm. Um, let's talk a little bit about free trade agreements and the EU. There's a massive backlash in the EU against big government control. The UK Independent Party in Britain is winning elections. They've won over 40% of the delegates to the EU uh, Parliament. The French uh, Party of Marie Le Pen, um, the National Front, has won the majority of the delegates to the European Parliament. So you see, the, the globalists are really worried. There's a backlash against this, and that backlash has increased with this immigration problem. You see, part of the globalist purposes in creating all of this mess in Syria was to create a flow of refugees that would flood Europe and water down the culture and make sure that Europe is never again like it was before, a predominantly white Christian nation. And that's the same thing that's happening here in the United States. And this agenda about immigration, illegal immigration and refugees has everything to do with making sure that conservatives in any of these countries never have the ability to win an election again. again. Now, in the 2012 election, I believe, uh, and they showed that the, the Democrats actually had a majority, but I don't think they were correct. I think that they made eight to 10 million votes, eight to 10 million votes disappear in 2012 in order to defeat Romney. And the reason I know that is because they said, according to the federal election data, that eight million people less voted in 2012 than 2008. Now, ask yourself the question, was there more enthusiasm or less enthusiasm in 2012 about getting rid of Obama? Was there more enthusiasm about Romney than McCain in 2012? Of course there was. A lot more enthusiasm. So, if they say that 8 million less people voted, it can't mean that 8 million less people voted. It means they made that many votes disappear, at least that many votes disappear in order to defeat him. And remember, 2012 was the first year that all the state votes were tallied at the federal level. And so when they came out with a national tally, you had no way of knowing where those 8 million votes went away because they were tallied at the federal level. It was a very slick proposition. But you can't get away with that too many times before people start to, to get on. And that's why they want to give you a Republican so that you won't contest what's coming on this next time. But in terms of immigration, a lot of people keep saying, you know, well, and you have a lot of conservative websites like World Net Daily who's got this, you know, they, they're, let me put it this way, the globalists have hyped the anti-Muslim agenda, not because Muslims aren't a problem, they are a problem. But they're not a threat to the world, they're not a threat to the United States. The Muslims, except for Iran, don't have any weapon systems of their own. You can't conquer the world when you don't make any of your own weapons. It's just like Iran. They got F-14s from the United States during the Shah. And once the Ayatollah came in and, this, and the U.S. said, cut the parts supply, those F-14s weren't flying a month later. And Iran learned its lesson. That's why the globalists have tried to take down Iran. You know, they give North Korea a free ride. No sanctions on North Korea. Nothing's happened. No military option on the table. No regime change required. It's the most tyrannical regime in all the world. So it's a living prison camp. Iran, a fairly civilized nation, we've got on the chopping block constantly since 2006. Three aircraft carrier groups off of Iran threatening them with destruction. Why? Because Iran's the only Muslim country that's threatening to develop all of their own indigenous weapon systems. Missiles, rockets, tanks airplanes, drones, they've got all that stuff in production. 
That's why the sanctions. That's why you've got to cut off Iran. And so why Syria? Why is Syria under the target? Because Israel was assigned as early as 2004 to take out Iran, or at least to start the war with Iran. The theory was you target Iran's nuclear program, they will retaliate against Israel and against all the American troops in the air. That will give us, the United States, an excuse to blast Iran to smithereens. We don't intend to occupy Iran, just destroy all of their military and civilian infrastructure, bring them to the dark ages, and then they'll be out of the picture. And that's what the U.S. was planning. But Israel says, look, we've got Syria right on our border, and Syria has thousands of Scud missiles with chemical weapons. They send a volley over towards Tel Aviv, and our Iron Dome can't possibly shoot down that many missiles. So you take Syria out, or we won't attack Iran. And so three years ago, the United States was ready to take out Syria. Remember that no-fly zone? It wasn't a no-fly zone. It's like Libya's no-fly zone. Got cruise missiles coming in all the time. That's not a no-fly zone. That's a, an excuse, a cover for an illicit attack operation. We had special forces in there. We had tomahawks. We had all kinds of... Uh, in fact, we blasted the city of Sirta with 20,000 inhabitants, killed almost everyone. And, and we're talking about Russian casualties in Syria? Come on. You know, we are the greatest hypocrite in the world in terms of civilian casualties. We did all that in Libya. And what's Libya today? It's a basket case full of armed jihadists total civil war, and we created it, we're responsible for that, all in the name of what, democracy? And uh, so we had this three years ago, this no-fly zone set up, and of course it, the, the media knew exactly what the U.S. was up to, and so John Kerry steps before the London press conference and says, starts talking about how we've got to, Assad's got to step down and we're going to, you know, take him out. And a reporter says, you know, it's very obvious to us that you're going to do an invasion and, uh, you know, with air power in Syria. Is there anything that Assad can do to stop this? Is there anything that he can do? And Kerry just off the top of his head, oh, yeah, they could give up their chemical weapons and we wouldn't at attack. And the next day, Syria says, we accept. <laughs> and um, Kerry got the biggest tongue lashing of his life when he stepped off that stage. You fool, you just ruined our agenda. You gave them an out. So the U.S. spent the next three months trying to prove that Assad was cheating on the weapons, on the chemical weapons disarmament. U.N. comes in and says, nope, they're not cheating. All false accusations. And so the U.S. was stuck. Ah, no, we're not stuck. Globalists don't take no for an answer. So what they did is they went in. You know, they were using Libyan arms and jihadists and shipping everyone in from all parts of the world where they had created unrest against the United States and, and started to build them up and arm them in Syria as Syrian rebels. It's not a civil war in Syria, by the way. This is an outside foreign intervention. Almost 80% of the soldiers in all of the rebel groups, including ISIS, are foreigners. And this is not a civil war. And Assad is not a bad guy. His father was. Hafez Assad was a bad guy. He was working with the Soviets. He was working with the CIA. He had torture chambers and rooms and other things. But his son he sent off to Europe to become a mild-mannered medical doctor. And he is just that. He's not a tyrant. He's trying to do his best to hold the country together. He has inherited a system that does have some corruption uh, in it. But generally speaking, he's trying to do what is right. But he has to go because the Israelis demand that, it, that Syria be defanged before they will attack Iran. By the way, that's the whole reason for the nuclear agreement. That came about at the same time as the chemical weapons. All of a sudden, the U.S. goes to Iran and says, hey, let's make a deal. And Iran says, what? After trying to attack us for the next last week, you want to offer us a deal? Yeah, let's have a nuclear deal, and you won't have to give up any of your centrifuges. You won't have to give up any of your enriched uranium. Let's just make a deal that in the future you won't do any more. And, his, and Iran says, and, and you lift the sanctions? Oh, yeah, we'll lift all the sanctions. So they start the negotiations. And then the U.S., after the first round, announces to the press, Iran has agreed to give up 50% of the centrifuges and 30% of their enriched uranium and, and don't do this. And the Iranians say, wait a minute. We didn't agree to any of that. And the U.S. said, oh, yes, you did. And the Iranians said, we have the recordings. They were tape recording all these negotiations. And the Iranians were right. The U.S. just simply 
upped the ante, invented out a full, you know, and pushed the Iranians um, after inducing them into the process, then raised the bar. And they did that a second time in the second stage of the negotiation. And they did it a third time. They even added conventional disarmament to the nuclear agreement. How many missiles they could have, how many tests of this and that they could have, how many tanks they could have. What's that got to do with the nuclear agreement? You see, the U.S. was pushing them because they knew Iran was desperate to have the sanctions removed. And so they kept pushing them and say, how much will they take? And the Iranians kept taking and taking. And finally, they had this deal finalized, right? Wrong. The Iranians didn't sign. When the Congress held hearings about the Iranian nuclear deal, the administration gave them the documents, and there are no signatures on them. Iran didn't sign. And so the head of the committee goes to the State Department and says, why are there no signatures? Iran didn't sign. And why are your signatures on them? We didn't sign either, because Iran didn't sign. Well, so what are we holding hearings for? This isn't in vogue. And the U.S. says, oh, yes, it is. It's a gentleman's agreement. <laughs> now, this is a big, fat trap, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, the U.S. entered into this negotiation with Iran specifically to have an excuse to stand down their aircraft carriers because, remember, they couldn't attack now because Israel's demanding to get rid of Syria first, and that was on hold because of the chemical weapons agreement. So you've got to put Iran on hold and that's what they did. You have a nuclear agreement, but it's a trap. There are so many details in there that Iran must violate and will violate, and the U.S. knows it will violate. And they have an automatic attack clause in the agreement. It becomes part of a U.N. resolution that says if Iran violates any of this, there is an automatic agreement that the U.N. will allow the U.S. to attack. So you see, it's a big, fat trap. It's not about peace at all. I mean, this is how deceptive all of this is. Did you read about any of this in the news? Well, you may have read about the fact that there was no signatures on it. That did make uh, some of the mainstream news. But this is a massive deception. It shows just how evil this government is that we're dealing with. And so that was the nuclear agreement. But because of the chemical weapons agreement, the U.S. was stuck in the water. But as I said, globalists don't take no for an answer. So what did they do? They went through their Israeli agents. The Israeli Mossad runs hundreds of Israeli Arabs as spies and leaders within the Arab movement. They infiltrate everything. The Israelis can't do it. Believe it or not, I was over in Israel and I said, you know, and my guide was telling me, well, he's a Jew and he's an Arab and he's in this type of area. And I said, how can you tell? They all look the same to me. Oh, we can tell. And believe me, they can tell. They can tell every nuance of facial feature and coloration of the skin of who's, what kind of Arab and what kind of Jew. So the Jews themselves can't go in and infiltrate Jordan and Iraq and, and others. But their Israeli Arabs can and have done that. It's my opinion that the Israelis, in combination with the CIA and British intelligence, have infiltrated almost all of the terror groups. They did it during Al-Qaeda. Al-Qaeda was a CIA operation at the very top. That doesn't mean that the terrorists in Al-Qaeda knew that. But the leadership, Osama bin Laden, was a CIA asset. That's why he showed up in the American hospital in Dubai just before 9-11 and, and met with the CIA station chief. He was an agent working for the CIA. He did not do 9-11. 9-11 was a U.S. government operation from beginning to end. Now, and so was Al-Qaeda. But you know, once you start doing a phony war on terror, everybody and their dog wants to become part of the big terror organization. So the U.S. was really getting fed up with everybody claiming to be Al-Qaeda. And nobody was, no matter what the U.S. did in the war on terror, Al-Qaeda just kept growing and growing, and so the American people got apathetic about winning the war on terror. Well, we'll fix this, says the globalists. We'll give them a new terror that they won't forget. They basically went in with their Israeli agents into, into Syria and said, all right, half of you guys, the worst of you, you're going to be called ISIS. And we know this happened because they're still doing it today. They just created the SRA, which is a Syrian, uh, or SDA, a Syrian Democratic Army. Out of nowhere, how did that start? They just said, you're now the SDA. 
you're these, uh, you know, uh, Free Syrian Army and the FRA and all these types of names. They just simply designate, and their leaders, of course, tell the people how to, uh, what to do these things. But you don't start a new terrorist organization with 50 to 60,000 people, combat uh, terrorists, in a three-week period. It's just impossible. But it is possible to just say, you guys are already here and you now are ISIS, and then start to direct them. And that's why every one of the, the beheading videos was meant and staged for one purpose only, to make a monster of ISIS. You know, if you're going to start a caliphate and take over the whole world as part of benevolent Muslim or Islam philosophy, why would you try to antagonize Muslims, Christians, I mean, they've gone after everybody in these videos. There's only one purpose of those videos, and that's to antagonize the whole world against them. What good is that? What's the purpose of that? Why antagonize the whole world against you? I mean, what does that do? It only does one thing. It promotes terror. A threat of terror so that the U.S. can go up and say, oh, now we've got another real terror. And you notice you never hear about Al-Qaeda Al -Qaeda anymore. What happened to Al-Qaeda? Everybody was Al-Qaeda, and now everybody's ISIS. Doesn't that ring any bells to you? Something's wrong with this picture. Look at the beheadings. You take these foreigners that were captured, and they sit there before the camera, and they give this heartfelt story about how ISIS is wonderful and it's doing this and that. I mean, where does this come from? And they say during the confession, we know that we're going to be killed, but you know, ISIS really is trying to do what's best, etc., etc. And then the knife goes to their throat. There's no flinching. Just as calm as a summer morning, and then the camera's cut. What does that tell you? Would you flinch if you knew you were going to be killed and a knife went? You'd go, be going like this, wouldn't you? Why would you even give the confession if you knew you were going to be killed? If you're going to be killed, why give the confession? I'm not going to cooperate. You see, Nobody asked any questions in the media about these anomalies. And then the orange jumpsuits. They must have had a container load of orange jumpsuits. Everybody's in orange jumpsuits. And then look at the Christians, remember, being led by the sea with these giant ISIS guys. And these Christians are all about, come up to here and all in orange jumpsuits. And they're all walking down the street. Every one of them a giant in ISIS and everyone diminutive. It's staged, ladies and gentlemen. Now, does that mean they weren't killed? Yes, the journalists were killed. But I think the proof is, it means that U.S. and British intelligence went and rescued these people and told them before you go back to the U.S. or France or wherever. Remember, they picked someone from every country so that every country would feel threatened by ISIS. And they said, before you go back, we want you to help us make an anti-ISIS video or a video to make ISIS look bad. We're going to pretend to kill you. And this will really help us destroy ISIS. That's why you have this one British accent guy with a hooded mask, Yihad John, doing all the beheadings. And you don't behead people with a knife. All of the previous beheadings from terrorists have been with a great big Arab sword. That's how you behead someone. This is a butchering job. In fact, they finally got the picture. They must be reading my World Affairs Brief because the latest video they actually do a seesaw video, and you do see blood coming out. Uh, this poor uh, Chechen, and, and what's really strange, though, is the new Yihad John is speaking Russian. I mean, nobody's asking any questions. Where does the ISIS people learn to speak Russian fluently? I mean, this is a setup, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, the Russians said, we don't know who this guy is. They took some Russian, captured him some way, and they did butcher him, but they actually showed the cutting for the first time. Well, I could tell you more, but let me tell you some of the other best proof that ISIS is a U.S. creation, and that is from a military standpoint. I'm a former military fighter attack pilot, and I'll tell you, our Navy pilots up there are really fed up with the U.S. government in the war on ISIS. They have said, and I've read their reports, that whenever we try to get permission to hit tanks or major concentration of troops, it takes almost an hour to get permission from Central Command. And they're up there flying in their airplane, and they have what's called bingo fuel. Bingo fuel means you get to a certain level and you've got to go back to base or you're going to run out before you get there. So when you're bingo fuel, you've got to go. And he said, almost every time that permission comes just about the time we're bingo fuel. 
and we have to turn around and can't do the mission. I compiled a list in today's World Affairs Brief of the targets that the U.S. just said we did. They got a bulldozer. They got one ISIS soldier out in the open, and they bragged about this in their center. You know, they give a briefing on what they have. And they got some underground uh, defensive position without telling what that was. It probably could have been a trench line or something. They put a bomb on it. I mean, that really is going to stop ISIS, isn't it? That's the kind of thing that we're dealing with, is that we, uh, you know, and the pilots aren't responsible for this. They're given a particular target. Now, of course, after the Paris attacks, which also have a lot of implications of false flag or phony government operations, which I'll, I'll get to in a minute, but of course France said, we're going to join the war on terror now. They also got their version of the Patriot Act without even passing a law. They basically can arrest anybody without a warrant, unconditional surveillance of everybody. It was just issued by decree because of the Paris attacks. That was their 9-11 and part of the reasons for doing that. You know, 9-11 was gave the U.S. the excuse to go rampaging through the world. The Paris attacks, Charlie Hebdo didn't do it, so the big Paris attack later did, and suddenly all of Europe lays down and says, do whatever it takes. So the French Air Force goes in and attacks ISIS the next day. Well, how do you get on target and, and devise what your targets are and go into combat within a day? You don't. This takes months of planning to decide where the targets are, and then you find out, Oh yeah, the U.S. gave us all the targets and we, you know, went in upon U.S. direction. So you're going to get a bulldozer and you're going to get a defensive position and a lone ISIS soldier here and there. And then we find out that the U.S. has been warning ISIS in advance of their attacks. When the Russians at the G20 mission, uh, Putin comes out with satellite photos saying, look at this. Today at the Turkish border here were 200 trucks lined up the Turkish border, oil tankers ready to go across the border. And here's the satellite phone showing them going across the border. Why isn't the U.S. taking those tankers out? That's the big income stream. And so the next day, the U.S. attacks a group of tanker trucks. But before they did so, they dropped a leaf that says, we are going to attack in 45 minutes. We suggest that you leave your trucks so that you don't get killed. Because we're concerned about civilian casualties. Did they throw any of those leaflets down before drone strikes? in Afghanistan, in Abbottabad, and other places of land? No, sir. What a phony excuse that we're concerned about. They were saving ISIS to make sure that nobody got killed. And that's the last time the U.S. bombed any oil trucks. Russians embarrass them. We go bomb because we're embarrassed, and we don't do it again because we're concerned about civilian casualties. I mean, this war is a joke, ladies and gentlemen. And that's why, under a year and a half of U.S. attacks on ISIS, ISIS just kept growing. Here's other evidence. As ISIS was moving into Iraq for this major attack, the Iraqis saw it coming. They were on the telephone with the White House saying, look, there's weapons depots out here, there's tank formations, we need air power to come in and hit them. Barack Obama and the National Security Council said, no, we're not going to get involved again in Iraq. So who was responsible for Iraq taking, or ISIS taking half of Iraq? The U.S. was. They could have stopped it. When they took Mosul, and remember, of course, they blame it on the Iraqi troops, who the U.S. trained at great military expense. The Iraqi troops fled for their lives, leaving behind all the American equipment. Well, ISIS had a big parade down the main highway coming out of Mosul with all these tanks and Humvees and Toyota Hilux pickups, which they got from the United States, by the way. And the U.S. has satellite reconnaissance constantly going on. You know, they have jets that were supposed to be giving direct air support. Do you think our... Navy fighter pilots were ever tasked to hit that column of troops. They could have got ISIS in one full thing. Not a single attack. Nothing. The Iraqi parliament also produced videos from their own soldiers of U.S. helicopters resupplying ISIS on the other side of the front. And then there's a video of the 75 or so Toyota Hilux pickup trucks coming down the highway with an Apache helicopter shadowing them below, not attacking them. What does that tell you? That's all very, very powerful evidence that the United States is protecting ISIS while pretending to attack ISIS. And that's why, and this is one of the other setbacks, probably the biggest of the list that I gave you, setbacks of globalism, the Russians, and I don't know why it took them so long, decided, hey, we can play this game too. 
We know the U.S. is faking their war on ISIS, so we're going to use the excuse of attacking terror, and we're going to go in there and save Assad. And that's exactly what they did. Two months ago, Russia intervened, 30-some-odd fighters, and now they're up to 60 with a second base. Uh, and they have really turned the war around uh, against the American-backed rebels. Aleppo is now under siege. Aleppo is the biggest city, or was the biggest city in Syria, and was completely decimated by ISIS. Um, and now they're taking it back. And they're having a tough battle because uh, without Russian troops on the ground, uh, they've got Hezbollah troops, they've got Iranian troops, and they've got the Syrian army, battle-hardened Syrian army. But the U.S. has given thousands of tow missiles to the um, Syrian rebels, and these are wire-guided missiles, ladies and gentlemen, and these are extremely accurate. I mean, you sit there and launch a tow missile at a tank, you have an optical viewfinder, you just guide it to the tank. There's just no misses. They used a tow missile to shoot down, and this is a war crime, to shoot down the Russian helicopter and went in to rescue the pilot of the Su-24 that was shot down by Turkey. And let me tell you the real reason why Turkey shot that airplane down. Russia had... Uh, Russia had let Iraq fall um, in just prior to Desert Storm because they figured, you know, we can learn and gain a lot more information by eavesdropping on U.S. military operations by letting Iraq fall than we could by defending uh, uh, Iraq. And that's what they did. Because the U.S. comes in, our standard military procedure, we use electronic jamming aircraft to jam all of their SAM surface-to-air missile sites something they didn't do for us in Vietnam, you know. Basically, they said you can't even target those SAM sites. You know, you have these big telephone poles being shot at you, uh, and that's what they look like, a telephone pole with a fire on the end of it coming up. And uh, we weren't allowed to stop. You weren't even allowed to arm your weapons until those missiles were on their way. I mean, that's how much we were required in the military to fight with our hands tied behind our back in Vietnam. But we went all out in Desert Storm. We had all the electronic jamming aircraft, and none of that SAM missile sites were able to touch our aircraft. We didn't have any, you know, we had dogfights, and we shot them down. It was just a turkey shoot. But all the while, the Russians were listening and capturing every one of our ECM jamming frequencies and what tactics and techniques we were using. And they have been, in the past 10, 20 years, developing counters to the countermeasures. And the U.S. has no intelligence on what the, China, uh, what the Russians have, none, because the Russians haven't been in combat at all until now. But the Russians brought in second-level stuff, Su-24s or old 1980s technology. They weren't using any air-to-air -air missiles. They weren't using any radar. They weren't using any jamming. And so the U.S. said, well, we'll fix that. We'll assign Turkey to take out one of their aircraft. That will force them to bring in air defense. And sure enough, Putin took the bait, brought in uh, AWACS types airplanes, brought in S-400s, the most sophisticated weapons. The U.S. doesn't have a clue of what kind of radar until now. Brought in S-300 type missile ships, uh, the Moskva uh, in the Mediterranean. So you see, Putin has now revealed all of his cadre, and that's exactly what the U.S. wanted. That's why they took the risk of having Turkey shoot one of those down. They also knew that Putin wasn't ready for Third World War and wasn't going to go to war. So you've seen a lot of hype on the Internet from Dave Hodges and, uh, you know, there's even Alex Jones said, uh, you know, this, this is going to imminent World War III. He had me on his show last Sunday, and I said, you know, I disagree, Alex. Respectfully, I realize that things look hot here, but here's why I don't believe this is going to lead to World War III. First of all, the Russians aren't ready. And they won't be ready until the beginning to the mid of next decade. All of their top-of-the-line weapon systems, and believe me, Russia and China are intending to strike the West, but they need, they need a full-capacity blue-water navy. They need you know, hundreds and hundreds of ships. You don't run a world war without having a huge blue-water navy, submarines, ballistic missile submarines, missile frigates, and all that stuff. And yes, China is developing hypersonic weapons. The Russians are developing hypersonic um, maneuvering warheads on their missiles while we're disarming. 
And that's another story. But it's very important to understand Russia is not ready. None of these first-line weapon systems are coming into production until 2020, 21, 22, and 23, and 24. Now, could they strike before then? Could. They wanted to commit suicide, but they're not stupid. And I don't think they're going to strike the West until the sometime, my gut feeling is about the middle of the next decade. Uh, but all I can say is, you know, when, when they're going to be ready, I don't really know. I and mean, we're dealing with three basic conspiratorial power centers in the world. The Anglo-American globalists who control the West, they are as much our enemy as the Russians and the Chinese, even though they pretend otherwise. Russian and Chinese are separate globalist powers. They are trying to create their own version of the New World Order. They have gone into a temporary alliance to take down the West, and they're planning to do that with a nuclear preemptive strike. And so Elder McConkie was not wrong when he said nuclear war, which certainly must come. It will come someday. And um, in my previous lectures to you, I have talked about how I think the United States is going to betray its own nation, allow the first strike to fall. This is a very important piece of information. Uh, and, uh, you know, there's a secret presidential decision directive, number 60, which basically instructs the military not to rely on launch on warning, but to be prepared to absorb a nuclear first strike and retaliate afterwards. Now, do you know what that means? Do you know what launch on warning is? Launch on warning means that when our satellites detect and they have all these heat sensors, when they see a rocket blast, they put everything automatically on alert. And if it is confirmed as a missile launch, they launch our missiles. Now, what does that do? It means the Russian and Chinese missiles coming in aimed at our missile silos hit what? Empty silos. The missiles are already gone. And our missiles can be retargeted in the air as long as they're in their boost phase and they can hit live targets that are still out there. So who wins in a nuclear war? The one who launches second, not first. Okay? So, in PDD-60, which is a, was t entitled a complete revamping of the U.S. nuclear posture, instead of the previous one in the Reagan administration was, you know, to win a nuclear war. That was the nuclear posture and the nuclear philosophy of the United States, and that's what they're preparing to win a nuclear war. The new posture under Bill Clinton's regime, 1997, was be prepared to absorb a nuclear first strike and retaliate afterwards. And General Butch Neal of the Marine Corps said, in reaction to that, retaliate with what? And the disarmament people said, well, you've got the ballistic missile submarines. No, you don't. Not all of them, because Bill Clinton in 1997, the same year, agreed to unilaterally keep 50% of our ballistic missile submarines in port at any one time so that we would prove to the Russians that we were vulnerable and that we would not be a threat to them. That's like laying down and saying, kill me, you know, I'm, or at least half of our soldiers, just to prove that we have no foul intent. Is this suicide? Is it stupid? No, no, it's a globalist agenda. It's to invite this nuclear strike. Why would the globalists want to do that? You know, if this is, as the left says, uh, a conspiracy about, power, about money, about greedy capitalism, then it doesn't make sense. Why would you invite a nuclear strike that would destroy the economy of America? Wouldn't that destroy the globalists and all their wealth as well? Sure it would. It's not about money. They are going to invite this strike. And part of that invitation is disarmament. You know, even though the Russians have cheated on every single disarmament treaty, the U.S. keeps dutifully disarming. We just removed all three of our warheads on our remaining Missile Man, Minuteman three missiles and turned them into single warhead missiles. Two-thirds reduction in our nuclear throw weight because we're abiding by SALT II. What are the Russians doing in return? They're building new Topol M SS-24 missiles every quarter. And how can they get away with that? Because the U.S. certifies that they're in Biden by the, 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 the treaties. They say that they, you know, basically it's because the U.S. has never been inspected, has never been able to inspect all of the Russian facilities. And so they basically state that whatever the Russians say they're in compliance, that that is the official view of the United States. 
Are they stupid? No, they're not stupid. They're basically giving Russia a pass. They're looking the other way, and Russians must be shaking head. These people must be stupid. They're just letting us get away with murder. General Habiger of the U.S. Strategic Command admitted, we've never been in Yamanto Mountain. Yamanto Mountain is the secret underground bunker in the Ural Mountains as big as the Washington, D.C. metro area underground. How can you certify that the Russians are in compliance with treaties when you've never been in Yamato Mountain. They could have stockpiles of missiles, they could have whole missile factories underneath there. They got six railroad lines coming in each entrance and they say it's a mining complex, but you never see mining cars coming out. 1997, that was revealed about Yamato Mountain. In the New York Times, front page, you can see it in November. And they asked the CIA, what do you think about this? Oh, we're not worried, it's defensive. How do you know it's defensive? You've never been in there. That just shows how they've been told to cover for the Russians. Why cover for the Russians? Because the globalists have been building Russia and China as nuclear powers and enemies since their creation in order to have an eventual nuclear war that will drive you into the arms of a global government. Now, why do they need war to do that? Aren't we just blending into a global government? Isn't that what WTO and uh, NAFTA and GATT are all about? Isn't that what the TPP is about and the TPIP is about? These world tra free trade organizations, anything but free trade, doesn't take a thousand pages or three thousand pages to enact free trade. These are mini globalist organizations that yield sovereignty. But I'll tell you, the globalists know that at some point when they start to inconvenience you, and you get sued for a wetlands violation and you've got to go to Brussels to defend yourself and hire an international attorney, you're going to say, enough. That's why they know they'll have to give you a war to force you into this. Helmut Kohl in 1997, that was a good year for the globalists, said that as much at the Maastricht Treaty uh, negotiations. They were wrangling among themselves about sovereignty and the problems of uh, the EU and globalism and giving too much power to the EU and Helmut Kohl got up in a speech and said, look, you people need to understand the only alternative to this European Union is war. And everybody looked at themselves, what does he mean, war? There's no sentiment for war. The Germans and Russians, there's no sentiment for war. They didn't realize that as a globalist he was saying, we're going to give you a war if you don't do this voluntarily. And that's what they've been doing ever since. That's what all of these interventions around the world are about, is to create conflict that will eventually lead to a world war. Now, as Alex and I discussed last Sunday, why is it that this war isn't going to lead to nuclear war? First of all, because Russia and China isn't ready. And secondly, this war in Syria doesn't justify going nuclear. And, the, and, and a conventional war with Russia won't serve globalist purposes. If you have a conventional war with Russia, you've got the full might of the United States and you can't be touched, essentially. We're all over the United States. Conventional weapons can't decapitate the U.S. military. And so you'd have a war. It'd be a patriotic war like World War II. And we'd have trouble winning it if you stay conventional. We've got a high-tech military, but it's very thin. All you've got to do is knock down some GPS satellites and we've got dumb airplanes again. And all you've got to do is run an EMP strike and we don't have electricity and other things. So, you know, a conventional, and, and the Russians and the Chinese have about ten times more conventional weapons than we do. So we've got high tech, but it's very thin. But you see, you, you can't drum the American people into a, we need a global government when you're running a war. No, we don't need a global government. The United States military is doing just fine. But if you allow a first strike to fall and you don't respond with launch on warning and our military gets decapitated, the whole world depends on the U.S. military to save them, don't they? Can you imagine what this world would be out w without the United States military? How would you feel? How would Europe feel? NATO is a pittance, you know, of, of the U.S. military power and they would feel very, very unnerved. So I'm telling you that that's what the globalists know. Now, Aren't the Russians and Chinese going to hit American cities? No, they're not, and the U.S. globalists know that. They know the Russians and Chinese intend to blackmail the West into submission after doing a, pre, a decapitating strike on our missile fields and our missile bases. Because then we have no way to, and the Russians and Chinese say, hey, you're not going to be able to defend yourself, give in. 
But our globalist leaders are going to come out of their bunkers and they're going to say, oh, we didn't know this was happening. You know, just like 9-11, we didn't know. Total surprise. But they're going to say, you know, our only salvation now is to join together in a militarized global government. And you'll hear those words someday. Our only possibility is to join in a militarized global government to prosecute this war. And what will you say? Whenever he's hunkered down and sick from fallout, and there's no electricity because it's been preceded by a, an EMP strike, you're going to say, no, 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 we don't want a global war. We're going to fight, you know, with what? You're just devastated. The American people are just going to say, do whatever it takes to save us, just like 9-11. But this is 9-11 on, on steroids. Now, that's what the globalists want, and that's why they're going to have a preemptive new... And, and then you ask yourself the question, how do the globalists intend to win this war after absorbing a nuclear first strike and letting our military get devastated? Well, my belief is that they have secret weapon systems that they've been developing. And we know the U.S. has massive black budgets, and they simply print the money to do it. It's off-budget. Congress doesn't authorize it. Remember the $300 hammers and the $400 toilet seats and those? Those things were cover stories for black budget money. That's why they were paying those high prices to Lockheed Martin and other, and Hughes Aircraft, et cetera, because that was money that was going to cover for black. Well, that's how they built the, the YF-17 stealth fighter without any congressional authorization. It came from the excess profits of $300 hammers multiplied by a million times. And that's where they suddenly came out of Area 51 where they tested this aircraft. And so I think they may even have space-based anti-missile systems. Now, you know, our current anti-ballistic missile systems have no warhead on them. They're called kinetic kill vehicles. No warhead. That means they must hit an incoming um, nuclear warhead at 10,000 miles an hour. They must hit it directly in order to destroy it. They must touch it. Boy, that's a real tough thing. You know what our, our success rate in, in, in controlled missile tests? Less than 50%. And do you know how many kinetic kill vec vessel, uh, vessels we have? We have 13 in Alaska, and we have, you know, in your um, Aegis missile systems, we probably got 300. The Russians have at least 300 missiles, each with 10 warheads on them. How are you going to stop that, you know, with 300 Aegis missiles with a warhead that, with a 50% kill rate? You're not going to do it. But I think the U.S. isn't stupid. I think the U.S. has other secret weapon systems they'll use not to protect us from that first strike, but once the first strike falls, they'll bring out those weapons to keep any further attacks from occurring while they regroup. And they may have many other secret weapon systems that we're not yet familiar with. In other words, they're not going to protect you because they want you to be panicked. That's why FEMA is preparing for nuclear war. That's why our government is preparing new bunkers all over the Washington, D.C. area, deep underground one a half a mile deep under the Naval Observatory, the, the vice president's residence started during Dick Cheney's tenure there. Is that for terrorism? They know a nuclear war is coming. Why do retired CIA and DEA and FBI officials building luxury homes in Aspen, Colorado have bunkers in the basement? Because they know what's coming, but you don't know. And that's been my message for many years to people, to wake up, you know, especially conservatives. We talk about fighting for our liberty and regaining our liberty. I'm telling you, I think that's not possible anymore. I think this secret combination of globalists in our government that runs puppet presidents is so powerful. And controlling the media, they control the Supreme Court. Remember John Roberts, the phone call on the night? You got to switch your vote. And he betrayed us. He was never a conservative. They've got goods, they've got dirt on every Supreme Court justice. They can turn any of them. They only don't do so very often, except in John Roberts' case, because they want you to keep thinking that you've got half of the Supreme Court as conservative. John Boehner was a globalist, so is Mitch McConnell running the Senate. Not a conservative, never has been. You've got to learn to see through those things, but I'm saying the secret combinations and power of this government, I don't think can be turned around. 
As I've said before, even if Ron Paul got elected, who cannot be bought, if he got elected president and instructed the NSA to surveil Henry Kissinger and Brent Scowcroft and Sandy Berger and all of these globalists, etc., and David Rockefeller and said, I want the goods on these people, and then discuss, I need evidence to prosecute, and you need evidence. We have a, a nation of laws. And the NSA would come back and say, there's nothing on them. Well, Ron Paul would say, I know there's got to be something. Is he going to go down there and run the surveillance equipment? You see, it's not possible. And even if you got the evidence, they control the courts. They would dismiss it, obtained illegally. They'd throw it out. What do you do? Look at how they overturned marriage and instituted gay marriage. And just by the flick of it, nobody resisted. We don't have any governors, even the two most conservative states in the Union, Idaho and Nevada, who have establishment governors. We don't have any governors who are willing to stand up to the feds and say no. And when Barack Obama gives the governors a message that you can't stop any of these illegal aliens coming in because once we certify they're legal, they're just like any citizen can drive through in any state. I mean, that may be true. But you certainly can throw out of your state any of these federally funded refugee organizations that are bringing them in. You can also stop them from buying land and having government subsidized housing because you own the land. I mean, you control the land in the state. So there is something that a state can do to stop these refugees from coming in. But a governor like Herbert, who is, you know, bowing down to the establishment, will never listen. And that's why, that's where our betrayal comes from, is from these establishment people trying to please, you know, everyone in power. Now, Gun control, as you know, has been a very important uh, aspect of, of the preparation for tyranny. I don't believe that they're going to get full gun control, but they're certainly trying hard. I can tell you that almost every mass shooting, in fact, I don't know of any mass shooting that doesn't have the fingerprints of a government operation in it. You see, even the most hardened criminals never go out and spray a group of innocent people with machine guns. It just doesn't happen. Unless they've been hypnotized or put on certain drugs and induced with certain mind control techniques to go out and do that. And hypnosis is very powerful. You should never use hypnosis for even if you think it's for a beneficial cause because when you yield yourself, which you have to yield yourself, yield your will to be able to be hypnotized, you allow Satan then to have to come in and plant ideas. The hypnotist may plant ideas too, but Satan can also plant visions and can plant ideas. And so you come away thinking, ooh, I've had some real experiences, but they're not real. You never give up your free will for any ethereal medical benefits that hypnosis may promise. It's just dangerous to do so. And I happen to know that the KGB and the and our government have worked for years with MK Ultra and other mind control programs using a combination of abuse, breaking them down, giving them rewards, and then putting them on certain drugs. And they have a cocktail of drugs you wouldn't believe. They can make people act crazy, they can make people act drunk, they can you know, increase sexual desire, they can do all kinds of things to compromise people with these drugs that they have. And you know, none of you know about it because it's secret. It's covered by national security. But it's very, very dangerous and very, very powerful. You look at the at John, or who was the um, the Planned Parenthood, uh, Russell Deere. His mugshot, like this. He's got big bug eyes like this, and and you know, in his mugshot, he said, "This guy is spaced out." And then you look at the CNN video, and I have the links in in this week's World Affairs Brief. You see the CNN uh, televideo of his hearing, and he's talking normally, his eyes are closed normally, and he's just, you know, you can tell this guy was on drugs when he was shooting up the Planned Parenthood outfit. He may well have been hypnotized, too. You know, the police said, oh, yeah, he, he talked about uh, no more uh, baby parts, and, uh, you know, he spit out these anti abortion things. This guy didn't look like an ideological person at all. It sounds like me. He was hypnotized. He was pre-drilled with these statements, say these statements when you are arrested. So that it, I mean, you, you think this is, you know, crazy. Government wouldn't do that, but they do do that. The MK Ultra victims have shown what they have done to them. Even children of people in the program have been put into this terrible, mind-controlled situation. Um, 
Mr. Holmes of the Batman shooting was also spaced out in his first hearing before the court. And the first thing the judge did was say to the psychiatrist, we need to get that psychiatrist to keep him on his meds. Acknowledging that the judge knew that he was on medication. Clay Bolden Harris and the Columbine shooting were also on meds. And there's also what we call the third shooter in most of these mass shootings, or the fourth shooter, or the second shooter. Adam Lanza, for example, was supposedly the only shooter using an AK-40 or not a, uh, an AR-15 to shoot all these little children in the school. Now, what would possess any human being to go in and mow down children in the school? It's just not possible, ladies and gentlemen, unless you've been hypnotized or drugged or a combination of both. But you also don't shoot children with an AR-15 and have the bullet stay in the body. I know. I've shot them all my military career. They go through people and especially little children. That coroner lied when he said that all these bullets came out of these. Uh, he lied, and they control a lot of coroners because coroners have to justify certain results uh, for cases, and they have to cover up. I believe those children were shot with handguns. And by the way, they really were shot. All this bogus stuff on the Internet about staged actors and other things is just bogus. The marathon bombing really did occur. It was a government operation once again, but there were people decapitated and, and lost their legs and other things. If you do any research at all, you can see those people. Uh, but the point is there, the cover-up that occurs is because the government has other shooters there. Uh, one boy talks to the television reporter right there and says, yeah, there was another man led away in handcuffs by the police. Now, that wasn't Adam Lanza because he was dead. So the police had enough, and another witness saw police take a person and sit him in a patrol car with handcuffs. Never heard about him. Where is he? The police, you know, refused. Now, why did Eric Holder come and talk to the Connecticut police and drill into them? You've got to be silent. I know a lot of you have seen things that you can't explain, but I'll tell you, this is national security, and if ever you utter a word about this, and he gave threats. Why would the Attorney General of the United States come and speak in closed-door session to the Connecticut police if it wasn't to threaten them to be silent because of what they saw? You look at the Paris mass massacre. It has many elements of a government operation. First of all, this was not a jihadist. Every one of the suicide bombers, once they get into their, their background, are what? They're into bar hopping, pornography. These are not Muslims. These are not religious people. And then there were the witnesses that saw the black Mercedes come up to the restaurants and the bars and mow down people. And it said they were white. These were not Muslims. These were not Middle Eastern. They were white professionals. And you notice that the Paris police never went and said they were looking for a black Mercedes. Never said they were looking for white people. Somebody told them, no, no, those are some of ours or something, to get the police and the media. And the media never asked. I mean, this came out in the Daily Mail, a major tabloid in, in England. You can't tell me that the French newspapers and the British and the American didn't see that article that I saw. And yet nobody ever went up to the authorities in these big press conferences and said, what about the black Mercedes and the two white guys that were muscular professionals, you know, mowing down people? Nobody. You know, there's got to be a major conspiracy about the media. No, no, you don't say that. You don't say that. Look what happened in the, in the, uh, in the recent terrible mass shooting in San Bernardino. None other than Carly Fiorina gets before Joe Scarborough, Morning Joe, MSNBC, and is being interviewed about how horrible this is. This is great and tragic. And then Scarborough starts to hit on the NRA. I'm 100% rated by the NRA, but the MRA is wrong about this. We've really got to have more gun control. He's really showing his true colors. And he starts to irritate Carly Fiorina. She knows she's got to be conservative, even though she's not really that conservative. Got to be conservative, so she starts to defend gun rights. And then she points out to Joe, you know, even your reporter this morning, when I was sitting here, talked about the ATF saying that a person bought that assault rifle on behalf of the police. Think about what I'm saying here. Remember the ATF said immediately, within hours, these guns were all legally acquired. And I said, wait a minute, how about some details? Who legally acquired them? How do you, you know, you've got to know who, what his status is to know if it's legally acquired and what the weapon was, because California has the most restrictive gun laws in, in, in the United States. But Carly Fiorina heard that report on NBC announcing the ATF says, 
There was a straw buyer. He didn't use those words, but he said someone bought it on behalf of the police. Now, this is why this is important. Because in California, an assault rifle cannot have a magazine more than 10 rounds. And there were pictures of the assault rifles with lots of 20 and 30 round magazines, etc. And it also has what's called a bullet button on it. If the public is going to buy it, you cannot release the magazine with the normal depressed button right by the magazine. You can't depress that button because it's fixed and it has a little drilled out hole and a special button that you have to use a tip of a bullet to press in the button to get the magazine out. Do you imagine how difficult that is? You get a fish a bullet out, you know, press it in to get the magazine out and switch a magazine. These two people shot over 75 rounds in the few minutes they were in there and I don't think they did that by using you know, the cumbersome bullet thing to get the magazine out. But the police can get those weapons, police only, without the bullet button. So when the ATF said these weapons were legally acquired, and then ATF admitted to one reporter that it was someone bought them on behalf of police, that meant these were non-bullet button, full combat you know, assault rifles that these people had gotten hold of. And Joe Scarborough immediately changed the subject and said, well, let's talk about the political situation. I mean, can you imagine a presidential candidate blowing this cover about, you know, here, somebody bought this on behalf of the police, and, and she said, how did it get into the hands of the terrorists? And he changed this to the subject. Of course, Joe Scarborough had seen the reporter, too, so he knew what was saying, and he wasn't about to mention it, but he wanted that buried. That's conspiracy, ladies and gentlemen. That's conspiracy to control the news. And you have to have those kinds of details. That's what I do in the World Affairs Brief. I read and have researchers that throw me all this information. I synthesize it so you don't have to search the internet, all of it yourself. I get the kind of details that show to you what this conspiracy is doing in life. And it's really horrendous. But in the Paris attacks, there were a couple of, uh, of other things. One, you know, the phony passport. Just like in 9-11, you know, you have all these bodies and people and airplanes destroyed, and you have a pristine passport of Mohammed Atta uh, float down and be completely right there for the government to pick up and say, oh, this is proof that he was on the aircraft. Let me tell you that none of those hijackers that the FBI named in 9-11 were the actual hijackers. These were the fake hijackers that were meant to put the blame on. And we know that they weren't the real hijackers because at least four of them are still alive. At least four of them are still alive. But this is the reason the government doesn't let you see the video cameras of the passengers getting on the airplanes. Do you know that's still classified? It's still classified because you would see that the hijackers getting on the airplane were not the ones that the FBI named. You don't, I can tell you as a pilot, you don't fly one of those big 757s or 767s by learning to fly on a Cessna. You wouldn't even know how to turn off the autopilot. It's that, I mean, there's a sea of switches in front of you. And, um, you know, a very experienced pilot, you know, could probably figure it out. But boy, somebody like that could never get up there and start to fly that airplane, let alone direct it. And we as pilots for 9-11 Truth have the radar tapes, by the way, that show that those hijacked aircrafts went over the Midwest of the United States and rendezvoused with another aircraft. And the other aircraft that they run, you know, you just don't see that up in the sky. Where two airplanes cross, and then they do 180 and go like this. You just don't see that unless they are coordinated. Every one of those airplanes that came in, including the, the one that hits the Pentagon, was a remote-controlled aircraft already pre-loaded with explosives and other things to do the damage that they had. And what happened to the, the, the passengers? We don't know. We only know that Flight 93 landed at Cleveland Airport and was put into the Nassau hangar there. That's why the FAA ordered a United identical airplane to land at Cleveland right after that so that any witnesses who said, we saw this airplane land and go in the NASA, oh, no, no, you didn't see that. You saw this United airplane that came in. I mean, this is a massive conspiracy. Uh, I could go on all day about 9-11 and the proof we have that this was a government controlled, only a government could have loaded these buildings with explosives and brought them down in the way that they did. So I am not optimistic about our chances of turning around and regaining our liberty. So what does that mean we have to do? This is a very important question because I don't believe that God will leave us helpless. 
I mean, you've spent a lot of time and effort in your life trying to preserve liberty. You're here tonight because you're interested in preserving liberty. I don't think it can be done as a nation anymore because I don't think the people are worthy. You have to ask yourself, why isn't God helping us? Why do we keep losing every battle? And part of that's because, you know, we're not worthy as a nation anymore. Sin is rampant, you know, homosexuality is getting rampant, and even among the good people, I'm ashamed to say that even in this state of Utah, most of the people are asleep. They're Republican, they're conservative, but they're asleep. And that's a problem. They're supposed to have the Holy Ghost, but they're asleep. And that's because many people innately inside can't handle tough truth, they're soft. You can tell that by the way that they don't discipline their children. Discipline is a mess in our society. Look at public schools. My biggest complaint of is not what they're taught. I can undo that at home. It's the cesspool of attitudes that they float in and the lack of discipline. You spend all of your time managing herds of people who aren't disciplined. Why do European schools and others do so well? It's not because of the curriculum, although it is with Common Core really teaching the test rather than teaching substance, but it is mostly that it's disciplined and quiet in those classes and people really are expected and you can be thrown out and you can't get back in a public school. You can't throw people out of a public school in the United States. It's their right to be there. Those are basic problems that no amount of curriculum development, no amount of you know, dealing in school boards is going to cure because it's endemic to our society. We've been taught by sociologists we have to be soft that Christ is soft, that Christ is all-loving. There is no justice. There is no guilt anymore. It's just all-loving acceptance. You even get that in your church. And it's not true. Christ has the full range of personality from mercy to fury, and he knows how to use it specifically. And anyone who listens to their conscience knows you get beat on the head more than you get patted on the back. You get dissatisfaction feelings. You shouldn't be doing that. No, uh uh, don't do that. Stop that. You know what I'm saying. It's not all about acceptance. So it's very, very important to understand because if we don't listen to the voice of conscience in our life, we won't hear the warning voice about these terrible things that are going to happen. And you haven't seen anything yet. If you see nuclear war descend upon this nation, even though it may not hit major cities, it will hit Air Force bases like Hill Air Force Base because the MX missile parts and guidance systems are stored at that base and the Soviets have to take them out. And the missile bodies themselves are out in the West Desert. And you're going to get fallout from those areas if the wind is coming from the Northwest. And so even though nuclear weapons have a destructive radius of about five miles, and it's fairly mild at the five mile uh, level, you're not going to die from the nuclear weapon, but you have to be careful of the fallout. And a lot of people, you get this information about, well, we're all going to die, so why even try? But you don't die. You just get sick, and you wish you were dead. But you need to prepare for fallout. Remember that 50% of Hiroshima and Nagasaki survived even without preparations. 50%. But they wished they were dead for three or four years, and many of them died of horrible cancers and things later on. So. Let me ask you a question. How many have ever been before to one of my talks? Would you raise your hand? All right, that's a pretty good percentage. That's about 80% of the audience have heard me before. I've warned people that this nuclear war is coming. In fact, I've written books to help people prepare. Do-it-yourself books, so you don't have to hire some expensive person to do it and things. I haven't done that for my health, but because I'm really sincerely concerned that we need to prepare. And I have done what I've preached. I have a fallout shelter in more than one place. We're now establishing a family farm so we can grow when there's famine away from the city. You try growing a garden in a suburban area when everyone else is starving. Can you see them? Your tomatoes are just turning green and there are hundreds of people around your fence. They're going to be picked clean in the morning. Never going to get ripe. And you think your fellow Mormons are prepared? Less than 10% of the active, and some think it's 5%, have anywhere close to a six-month supply, let alone a year's supply. 
Church welfare system? The church knows it's not going to go very far. If people aren't prepared, they depend on people to get prepared. So it's very, very important that you listen to my warning. As sure as I'm living today, you will live through a nuclear war. And you have to, if you're going to get up on the other side and defend liberty, because I think there will be pockets of liberty, and then explain how this is going to happen. Right now, most of you feel isolated, don't you? Even in Mormon neighborhoods. You can't go to your neighbor and talk about what we're talking about tonight, can you? They just laugh at you or roll their eyes. Think about other people outside of Utah. They can't talk to anyone. Every one of us feels isolated and relatively alone. But war will change that. For example, in New York, you have hundreds of thousands of Latter-day Saints. You have, I mean, well, in Los Angeles you do. In New York, you have a few thousand. Uh, but in every major city, you have stakes and wards and Latter-day Saints, and you have good Christians and other people who are concerned and who are conservative. Why are they staying in these big cities, even when they're nuclear targets like Seattle, San Francisco, San Diego, Colorado Springs, Omaha, Nebraska, Jacksonville, Florida? Those are dead cities someday. But why do they stay there? Because of the job. And I can't fault them for it. I mean, people have to make a living. You can't all move out to the country and expect to survive. But when war comes and an EMP strike proceeds, that's going to wipe out all electricity. And by the way, it isn't going to happen with Iran or some rogue terrorist nation. It takes six Six high-altitude nuclear weapons to blanket the United States and take down the whole grid. Only Russia and China have the capacity of doing that. Not even North Korea does. You do one EMP strike over LA, yeah, it's going to blanket that area. But the latest target data shows that it's about a circle of 100 to 300 miles around underneath that where the major damage occurs and the rest is not damaged particularly. And even cars will survive outside those 100 to 300 mile circles. They may shut down, but they can be restarted again. So it isn't true that all vehicles will be off the road or everything will be destroyed. Um, but when, when Russia and China attack, they will throw six, at least six, up in the high altitude and it will blanket the whole grid and the grid's going down. And it may stay down from anywhere from six weeks to a year, depending on how, what the supply of fuses that are blown and equipment that is fried and how long it takes to get that back into position. Some grid things cannot, some generators cannot even start up unless there's grid power. They may be operating, but unless they sense there's grid power to feed it into, they have no place to put the power that they generate, so they can't start up. Other uh, smaller plants, uh, you know, can, depending on the size of the grid. So within three days of an EMP strike and the nuclear strike that follows, which will hit the military targets, they'll be really pillaging in the streets because everyone panics. All the store shelves will be empty, just like books like Lights Out and other things have. But the only problem with these EMP books is they talk about a lone terror strike, you know, doing all this, and it's just not true. But when the Russians and Chinese decide, decide to strike, after we've disarmed enough and laid supinely on the ground and invited their strikes and antagonized them, as we're doing, then watch out. And I think the trigger event, by the way, is going to be North Korea. There's got to be a reason to explain why North Korea, the most horrible nation on the earth, is given a pass by our militaristic globalist leaders. No sanctions, no military option on the table, no regime change required as compared to Iran. What's the explanation? Globalists know North Korea is going to be the trigger event, and they're preserving it. And here's how North Korea starts it. When you see North Korea do a mass invasion of South Korea, 2 million men versus 50,000 men, and 20,000 artillery tubes taking down Seoul, you'll know that within a week we're going to have nuclear war. Why? Because the only way the U.S. can protect its 13,000 troops, combat troops there, there's 20 some thousand, but 13 are combat troops, from annihilation is to use tactical nukes to stop this invasion. And once they do that, guess what China says? Ah, you started it. And now we can stop you. And so the U.S. gets suckered into using tactical nukes, and then China and Russia can say, you started it, and now launch a preemptive strike. So if you see a, an attack on North Korea, you wish you had your preparations made, because you've got a week at most maybe even three days. 
So watch out for those particular signs. Now what I'm saying about preparedness is it's not enough to have food and water storage or even cold weather clothing. You've got to survive this war if you're going to live on the other side to redeem freedom in the pockets of liberty. And what I was explaining to you is when this pillaging starts in cities, what do you think the good people are going to do? Are they going to stay around for the job? There's no job anymore, is there? Nobody's going to work. Even the government won't have any control because policemen and firemen are not coming to work if their families are starving and they're pillaging masses in the street. You think policemen are going to come to work? They're not. And so there's nothing to keep good people in this melee of social unrest, is there? They'll start to flee. And if they've read my book, Strategic Relocation, they'll know where safe places are. They'll start to flee. And some people would just feel inspired. Go west or go east or go north or south. And they'll hear rumors about their safety there. And that's where some of the prophecies about the Mormons happen. There'll be safety among the Mormons. Why? It's not that the Mormons are all prepared, but they'll knit together faster probably than any other community. Why? Because you've got this alternate system of government. Home teachers for every five families, etc. Hierarchy of leadership. That will knit together people, and so that would become a magnet for a lot of good people. I think that someday after war starts, when people are fleeing cities, you'll find huge numbers, hundreds of thousands coming to these valleys for safety because they will see there's more order here, less chaos, not no chaos, but less chaos, and an ability to work together faster. And so that's how the Lord sometimes works marvelous miracles. No longer will good people be outnumbered. There'll now be new majorities. New majorities of people who will say, okay, we see what the government did, we see what's going on and stuff, and unfortunately it won't be that clear. You know, the government will still think still claim that we didn't know this, you know, and people like Joel Skousen who claims that we planned this, you know, ought to be hung. There'll be a lot of people agree with him. And you'll have to take a stand someday, those of you who believe in conspiracy versus those that are deniers of conspiracy. And I believe that you'll be the Jews of World War III. The government will call to lock up people who are dissidents, who believe that we're responsible. They're not supporting our troops. That's the danger that we face. So no one's going to be able to sit on the fence. You're going to have to make a choice. Either deny that you believe that globalism is evil and the government has created this or go along with it. And that's where the New World Order comes in. That's where the Mark of the Beast comes in. Probably an oath of allegiance to the New World Order and you won't be able to be a doctor or a lawyer or buy or sell unless you're a citizen of the new global government. And those of us that won't take the citizenship won't be able, we'll have to be, live underground. So you see, it's not going to be easy. But I think even globalism has to play lip service to democracy. So if there are new majorities in areas where you are free and you demand liberty and demand the restoration of the Constitution and not globalism, then you see they can't just come in and squash that, you know, if it's democratically. But you have to be prepared to be active politically. You have to have experience. You have to know that in the coming chaos, that the traditional lawyers will say, hey, we know how to run a government. You've got to be prepared to have alternatives so that they don't go back to the same old case law that has degraded our Constitution and run it like that. You will have to know. That's one of the reasons why in my talk at UVU, I gave a speech on why the Constitution is dead and how to fix it. How do you rewrite the Constitution in tight legal language? Now, I'm not saying a con-con. I'm not in favor of constitutional convention. We would never even get elected to be a delegate at that. Only conventional lawyers would do. So that's a dead end. But you know, if when there is war and people coming in, if we educate one another and say, all right, look, we've got a chance to restore God. Let's do it in tight legal language. And you know what the secret is? The secret, if you change the language to make it tight legally so they can't interpret it anymore, none of the case law works anymore. Precedent doesn't have it. They, the lawyers can't use precedent. No, we got new language. It tightens it up. You can't have socialism anymore in this country because it's tightly written. So I talk about that in this one, and I've got some copies of that if you're interested in that. Some of the other books that I brought, and you can get these because you came to this tonight at a, a very severe discount. Um, one of the, probably the most important books that you can pick up is this high, how to implement a high, or the high security shelter book. 
This is how to do a, a fallout shelter in a basement. And more than just a fallout shelter, it, the purpose is to do concealed shelters in the basement. Concealment's very important because just as the Jews had to be hidden by friends to keep them from being rounded up, you'll have to hide friends someday. It's not just a matter of survival, you have to hide people. And it's not going to be easy to do if you haven't already prepared to do those things. So concealment's important, also having radiation protection. And this is a complete do-it-yourself manual. This is the cheapest alternative for most people. I mean, if you can afford to do new construction, my big book, The Secure Home, 700 pages, does everything in new construction and remodeling. You know, if you're going to do an addition to the house or an addition to the garage, you can put a first-class, all-concrete shelter under it. But it'll cost you, you know, thirty to forty to fifty thousand dollars. This can be done for less than three to four. So you see, people, you know, you can save that much in a couple of years just by not going out to dinner. So even if you have limited funds, you need to protect yourself and do those things. Now, most of you living in Utah probably don't need my best-selling book, Strategic Relocation. But some of your children may need it, or grandchildren who's ever out in the hinterland may need them to go where safe places are. And part of this book talks about contingency planning. If you're living in a big city and can't leave, how do you develop contingency plans to get out of Dodge? One of the secrets in the book is to watch for um, what I call um, beltways around, you know, freeways. They're really like a moat around the city. You know, you can't get past the beltway unless if you go through an underpass or an overpass. And you know, if it's a, a situation like uh, uh, like uh, Katrina in New Orleans, all the freeways are clogged. You can't get on or off of the freeways. They're just a trap zone. But, as I point out in the book, if you look at Google Maps satellite version and zoom, zoom in and, and trace that freeway and you can see there are a few over and underpasses where there's no exit or on-ramp. And that means you've got free passage over that. So you must plan out. Teach your children to plan out. If you're going to get out of Dodge someday, I mean, it's panic. You need to stay on the surface streets and, and know how to get past these freeways where there's no entrance or, or on-ramp because they'll be clogged. Those are the kinds of tips that I give to help people know that you can do things even if you can't afford a full retreat. But you live in one of the top two rated states that are highest rated states, Utah and Idaho, that I have in the book. Uh, but there are safer places than these valleys that are getting very, very crowded. And so many of you may, if you're trying to establish like we are a family farm in a safer area in Utah, you may want to pick up this book. So this book is normally uh, $45 and you can get this for 30 today. S high security shelter is normally 25 and that's 15. And this is normally 35 and it's 20. Um, and then I have a 10 packs for survival. This is a storage booklet, 10 packs that are very, uh, whether from medical to food to water to barter lists and other things, it's a really handy pack. Normally five, but just $3. So my son, Andrew, uh, back in the corner will have these books available. And uh, I'll now take a few questions if you have any. Yes, sir. Yeah, uh, I went to your uh, meeting in Highland about two years ago, and you stated that people should not join the military because they're basically running for a suicide mission because they want to be killed in a nuclear strike. Um, what I'm wondering is, do you anticipate a draft coming in before World War III? The question is, you know, I have spoken about not encouraging people to go into the military. And the reason is because, first of all, you're not out there serving and protecting American interests. You may think you are, but you're not. You're serving globalist interests. And it, you can talk to anybody over in Iraq and Iran, and they know, yep, we're not really serving, you know, the cause of liberty. Remember, the second point is your government will not protect you. They're going to let a nuclear strike fall on military forces, and so you do your sons and daughters and grandchildren no service by encouraging them to go in the military and to be nuked someday. I'm, you know, I say this with great sadness as a former military officer, but I do not trust our leaders to protect our troops, no matter what they say. So 
I do expect there to be a draft, but only after the war starts. Um, I think they've got plenty of um, you know, people to, especially now that they're opening combat to women, it's, uh, it's a death knell to morale and, and good order of uh, discipline in the military to have women in tight quarters. I mean, the rape level at Navy ships and on submarines is just astronomic. And the cover-up for military officers about that in order to get this women in combat thing is just criminal. Don't, believe me, don't let your children go into an organization that is beholden to the globalist and is filled with officers who are compromising yes-men to the political system. But yes, there will be a draft, but I think only after war starts. Sir. Yeah, so clearly we're headed for a financial crisis. How does that figure into the globalist agenda? I believe strongly, and I pointed out in my World Affairs brief, there's several issues of explaining in detail why I don't believe there's going to be a financial collapse, an economic collapse before the war. Think of it this way. The Fed has the power to continue to keep this going just like they are with judicious use of the printing press. And I mean judicious. People talk about, look, it's got to end in hyperinflation because the only thing the Fed can do is print money. True, but false. Only thing they can do is print money. But if they do it judiciously, keeping the inflation rate below 10%, it doesn't arise to hyperinflation. And you can't get hyperinflation, by the way, unless you have indexing. What's indexing? It's where your salaries get automatically increased by law to keep it. That's what happened in Germany. How do you think they had wheelbarrow fulls of 100,000 mark bills? Could you have wheelbarrow fulls of $100 bills? No, because you don't have a means. They had in Germany, by mandate, everyone's salary gets increased with the rate of inflation. And that's the way it goes to the moon. Without indexing, you can't get there. You get stagflation, meaning inflation goes to 20% and suddenly you can't buy, you can't drive because you can't afford gas. You stop buying and the economy, what, comes down doesn't keep going to hyperinflation. Stagflation stops hyperinflation when you don't have indexing. So those are the types of things I explain. The yen or the yuan being received as a yuan or an IMF SDR currency is not going to collapse the dollar. It's not going to make any difference at all to the dollar because nobody trusts the yuan. No one's going to jump to the yuan. You don't know how much they're printing. At least we know how much the Fed is printing, but we don't know how much the Chinese are. So think of it this way. What better way for the globalist to save themselves is to wait till war comes, because war will bring a collapse. Then you've got an excuse to have a new world currency, because you've got to have a world government before you get a world currency, right? Otherwise, who's going to run the world currency? The Fed? So think of it. Remember, if they let war come, then we're still the heroes. We still get to dictate to you, because it's not our fault. If they let a collapse occur before that time, Everyone will know to the very day the Fed dropped the money supply, and they'll get the blame, and they'll be held to pay. So I don't think, now that, saying that, I don't, I believe there could very well be a stock market corruption of up to 20%, but it won't be a collapse. In fact, there never has been an economic collapse on the face of the earth except in wars of massive destruction. The German economy collapsed because they were all fleeing from the Russians, and you can't do any business when you're fleeing. The Russian economy did not collapse, contrary to the phony. It was a phony fall of the Soviet Union. It was a carefully crafted deception. It went down to a survival level because communism isn't very good at producing goods and services. 